All right, so we're uh, going to bring up our next speaker. And this is sort of an interesting story. I'm not going to go, the bio's in the book. I want to tell you the story. And the numbers are actually sort of astounding when you see them. Uh, Shannon Schuyler is the chief purpose officer. That is actually her title for PricewaterhouseCoopers. Now, Shannon actually, and, and somewhere in my records, I talked to her in 1997. I must have pitched her something because she was a senior talent acquisition uh, professional at PricewaterhouseCoopers. She then moved to the area of corporate responsibility and ran their corporate responsibility program for a number of years uh, and uh, you know, took them uh, to a, a level of, of significant sophistication. Um, in fact, we, we honored their uh, CEO, or actually their, their uh, global chairman, Bob Moritz, as one of our CEO of the years uh, for uh, corporate responsibility. And Shannon uh, then was called upon for a different uh, type of duty. And this is a pretty amazing uh, level of responsibility to have. As the chief purpose officer, she has to go out. And, and when you get the, the, the numbers at PwC, I mean, you know, tens of thousands of thousands of employees, but about two thirds of them roughly, or give or take, are millennials. And what's very critical is the millennials um, have a bit of a different attitude. Now we're, tomorrow, sh shameless plug for this, we're gonna have a session on what we call the Millennial Advantage, a program, a uh, research program we did uh, with the sponsorship of um, Advantage XPO. We did discover a couple of really important things about millennials. First of all, they are actually the same species as older people, right? We're all human, okay? And there weren't as many differences, but they have a different sense of evolved um, sensibility about making sure that what they do matters. So understanding purpose is critical to their feeling part of the mission of the company. And Shannon's specific goal is to spend every day communicating with the millennial audience about what PwC does and why it's important and why they should want to be part of it. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage Shannon Schuyler from PricewaterhouseCoopers. So back to, um, I, I feel like I'm at home because this is where I started in human resources and really the evolution of what I've done in my career has really been trying to figure out how do you continue to engage employees as the world changes around you. I think that's why now I find myself looking at purpose because when you look at where we are, and let me be clear, we, we currently are 80% millennials at PwC. We got there far faster considering the number of people that we hire. We have 250,000 people globally. 80% of them are millennials. It has actually helped our business incredibly, but we have to do things very differently. So that has helped us move forward, but purpose is not about millennials. I'll be really clear. Purpose is really about all employees fundamentally looking at every hour in the day differently. And so I want to walk you through why this has been such a change and what we've seen from some surveys and some different things that we've done. First of all, I want to ground you in what purpose really is. So personally, right, purpose is your North Star. It's the motivational force that drives why you are you, why you exist, why you do the things that you do which are different than somebody else. For a company, it should be the same thing. It is the reason that they are in business. It is the why they exist. Purpose has the ability to bring humanity to the products and services that companies actually produce and they have to really optimize impact. And that impact has to now go far beyond just revenue generation. But what does it actually mean to transform an organization? Because when you're dealing with a company that has purpose, they no longer are focused on the transaction. It's not about going down the list and checking the box. It's not about what month and what revenue it looks like this month or next month. It's about how do we transform? How are we transformative in the products and the services that we offer? How can we be disruptive? How can we be innovative? How can we do things differently than we always have been? When you're guided by something bigger than just a transaction, you can look beyond that, and that's where our employees now. They don't want to be a part of a transaction. 
They know what the price of every minute is in their life, and they want to be transformational. So the whole nature of purpose is it allows you to bring together the human story within your organizations, as well as the business story, to illuminate for your employees what is the impact your business has on society? Because just so you know, regardless if you're a professional services firm or what you actually do, they care about that. They want to know what do we do and what are we offering and how does that contribute to the issues that are happening in society? And why is that? Because we are at fundamentally a different time in our lives when you look at what is going on around the world. When we talk about CEOs, and we do a survey every year to CEOs, about what are the things that make you think you need to change your business strategy or look for new products and services, there's megatrends that they talk to. They're around climate change. We gotta figure out what are we gonna do, what are we not gonna do, even though that might not be material to our business, we're still in the ecosystem, we have to figure it out. Looking at the changes in world powers, thinking about how are we going to now get people to the E7 versus the G7 to be able to leverage and to elevate those individuals in those growing communities. They're thinking about these issues. But three that we have found that not only CEOs focus on, but employees really see and are trying to figure out how they can be a part of is one, the first around urbanization. So when you think about it, 50% of the world's population currently lives in cities. That's up from 30% about 20 years ago, and will be at 80% live in cities in the next 20 years. Cities were not built to accommodate that many people living in them. You think about issues around infrastructure. It's going to cost around $8 trillion over the next 10 years just to address infrastructure issues in New York, London, Beijing, and Shanghai. Just those four cities. So think about the cities that you live in. Think about issues around education, around healthcare, around roads. Fundamentally, we cannot absorb the people who are coming in there if we solely look at government wanting to leverage taxes or nonprofits, which means that companies have to step up and say, what is our role to play within individual communities that we can actually elevate them to make sure we can continue to accommodate and have people live in these cities? So in Chicago alone, there's 600,000 people who live in food deserts. If you don't know what a food desert is, that is people live in places that they do not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Literally don't. There's not a corner store, they're not walking into a Whole Foods to be able to get fruits and vegetables. What does that mean? Huge issues around education, because kids can't learn unless they have fresh nutrients. And also you have significant issues just in general around healthcare. So you have companies that are driven by ideas that employees have to say, let's figure out how do you open a Whole Foods on the west and south side? How could we build a model where we could charge less for the same exact products to allow people to have access to those fruits and vegetables, thus allowing the education system to get better in those areas where otherwise we couldn't accommodate because we don't have the taxes to be able to put there to make it work. You also have issues when you're looking at demographic shifts. And obviously, I think all of us have gone through what does that look like, the sh changing demographics, let alone what's happened with immigrants and refugees coming in and, and, and how do we actually deal with those issues. But what's interesting is over the next 10 years, 1.15 billion more people are going to be on this planet, and the biggest growing population are those individuals who are 65 years of age and older. Those individuals that we have decided you should be retired, and you really shouldn't need anything because you should be retired and your kids should be grown. And now what we're realizing is, first of all, they don't want to be retired. They have the intellect and the passion and they're healthy and they want to work. And so what do we figure out that we're going to do to allow these people to continue to have a living, to pay for their families and to do the things they want to do? The airline industry, again, driven by what employees have seen, have said we can actually use those individuals. We can actually use, I got it, thank you. We can actually use those individuals and we can leverage them to be able to build the relationships of the things that they're doing. So 34% now of individuals hired for airline industries are those people who are 65 age and older because they said we can help solve that. That's something that government doesn't have to pay for. We can figure out what that looks like and we can do that.
And then certainly the one that we hear the absolute most about from CEOs as well as people within companies, employees trying to solve for, is the issues around technology and how you can leverage your business and your products to use technology for good. And so when you think about it, 79 million people, it took 79 years for 50 million people to be able to access a landline phone. It took 10 years for 50 million people to use a mobile phone. It took 3.5 years for 50 million people to use Facebook. It took three days for 50 million people to use what game on their phones? Candy Crush. Sorry, Pokemon Go, uh-uh, still Candy Crush. They still have it. Think about how fast people are able to be connected. Think about that, what that means, that we're now able to connect this entire ecosystem around the world and be able to allow people to share things, but with that comes this enormous issue around cybersecurity. Over $4 trillion a year is spent simply to address cybersecurity issues. So you have different industries looking at what does that look like. Financial services industry is looking at leveraging blockchain technology. What is blockchain? Blockchain is the ability to track a transaction, your mortgage, your car payment, from the time that you cash in that deal and follow the money as it goes all the way through the process. At any time, you could figure out where your dollars are. And the thought is that it will build transparency within the financial services industry and hopefully rebuild trust. Employees within the financial services industry have said, well, we could leverage blockchain technology for more than just what banks might use it for, or other financial services institutions. What if we gave this technology to places like the Gates Foundation and the American Red Cross and others so they could actually track when you make a $5 donation on your phone exactly where that $5 goes? So how are we able to use our skills in exactly the same way that we're getting paid and making revenue on this side by pivoting it and doing something for society on the other side? So with these immense problems comes a great opportunity. And that great opportunity is the ability to be guided by purpose. And this is the time that people are looking at, what does that look like in my job? How can I actually take time to do that? So as we saw this unfold, we said, well, let's do a survey on it. We had been about two years into getting our purpose statement out there to build trust in society and solve important problems, and we did like many people do. We sent it out via email. This is our purpose statement. Like, go and conquer, right? Like, suddenly your actions should just change because this is so great. Well, nothing changed. In fact, the first people survey that we did, we asked people to pick from five, which is our purpose statement, and we had a lower percentage than like what a dog would pick. That's actually what the survey people came back and said. And we were like, well, that's pretty bad. And so our CEO said, well, we can do one of two things. We can either decide we don't care at all and let it go and just have a nice tagline, or we actually can say we, we think this is how we're going to differentiate ourselves. We think that this is something that we need to do and we should do. And with that, I was asked to take on the role to wake up and to think about it every day and to figure out how could we actually do that. And considering where the scores were, I felt we only had upside. So it was a great career move for me. Um, and so w the first thing we did was say, okay, well, let's do a survey and let's figure out what people are actually thinking about purpose. And where we thought was the most important groups is we said we're going to do a global survey couple thousand people across sectors, across different territories, and we want to look at the difference between what C-suite and CEOs think about purpose and what an employee thinks about purpose and figure out what are some of the things that come out of there. And it was fascinating. Good news is everyone universally said purpose was important and critical to business success. We were like, great. And then we saw the gaps that were out there. First gap, sometimes purpose is just used as a tagline. So currently, you have 79% of the C-suite that we interviewed said, yes, critical to success. You need purpose. Purpose is the next wave. Get on the bus. Let's go. However, when we asked, so what are you doing to make sure that comes to life and really is something within your organization? Only 34% said, oh, we've actually changed something, right? So really important critical, 
but we're not using it as a guidepost. We're not using it in our decision-making process. We think it's really good, but we're not really going to change what we do. Also found out of those, only 27% were actually looking at their employees differently. So only 27% were changing their reward system, were changing their performance management, were actually saying, when we see this happening, we're going to really give you visibility so people knew it was the right thing to do. So 79%, very important, action's not really taken. It's similar to a survey that we recently did around employee engagement saying, where are you in this mix? And the first mix is fundamental. You're just communicating, right? You're just saying it. And the second says we're developing. You're actually trying to connect those communications to your mission and to your vision, which is different than your purpose. And the third is that you're actually being distinctive where you're linking it to your processes, your behaviors, and to your purpose of your organization. Because that's where your employees ultimately want to be. They want to believe that it's real, it's not just a tagline, and they will watch now more than ever how authentic you are and how authentic leadership is in actually changing those pro processes to make sure that you are using your purpose as a guide. Second thing that we found out was that people think of purpose very differently. So even though you say it's something that's really important and that was universal, why it's important is very different. The C-suite said, I think it's really important because it drives reputation and visibility, growth and innovation, and ultimately revenue. Employees said, I think it's really important, 83%, because it brings meaning to my job. And why is that important? Again, it's not just millennials who thought this was important. This was across the generations. Is that now they recognize how limited their time is in general on this planet, and they want to make sure that the 8, 10, 12 hours that they spend during their work day is actually something meaningful. So as Elliot said, I moved from corporate responsibility and now I'm doing purpose. Employees believe that corporate responsibility is something that you should do and is good to do, but that's a volunteer time. I want to know throughout my work day and the skills that you're teaching me are actually things that I can use and pivot in a different direction to be able to make a greater impact than just that client who is sending me the check. And they mean it, right? They want to make sure throughout that entire day they understand why they're doing the things that they do and why is that bigger than just them. The other thing that we found is that it matters who talks about purpose. So, you know, I told you that what we did is just on high, right? CEO sends out the purpose statement. Ah, right, we should change. You know, we send out a lot of newsletters. Again, 225,000 people, 250,000. And we realized that employees actually really don't want to hear it from your CEO. Really don't. They really don't trust leadership, especially with purpose. Because purpose to them is something special. Now, the CEO, yes, should be somebody who's communicating all the time about how are we doing financially, what are some of the big transactions that are happening. But purpose, they need to bring it down, right? And so even though you might have it communicated by your CEO, they want it on the ground. And so you have about 50% saying, actually, the way I want to hear about purpose the most is from externally from my customers and my clients saying that this is how we see you work. And so not our CEO saying, hey, this is how we build trust, but a client saying, gosh, we really trust you. We trust the things that you're doing. 36% say, I want to hear it from a colleague. The one thing that is very specific to millennials, they only trust other millennials. That's true, because they believe that they're kind of they get each other. They get each other. They want to be able to trust. And if you say you've seen it, then I can kind of believe that I've seen it. I mean, they've seen a lot going on over the last 15 years of this economy. And they pick who they want to be able to listen to. But I think it's really important that you allow that to happen, right? They want to hear about your purpose through storytelling. They don't want it just to be something that is this concrete, unemotional. Purpose is emotional. 
know, when we first started talking about purpose, we said, here's the deal. We're going to talk about purpose, and there's kind of three different areas of it. You have organizational purpose, which is that build trust in society and solve important problems. It seems really hard to grasp. You have the individual purpose, which when we started talking about it, our, our leadership team was like, okay, we can't ask anyone about their individual purpose because if we do, they'll all want to leave and like join a nonprofit. We're like, that's no, they're at, no, 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 no. They, they actually don't want to do that. They went to school, they're interested in being here, but they want to know that there's more value to it than we're showing them. Because the key that you're trying to get is what is your role purpose? So you can have, these are my things individually that I bring that make me who I am. And I know organizationally, these are the things that my company feels it's important to stand for and how we can be additive to society as well as be a successful business. The issue is what my role is in between and how can I take both pieces of that puzzle, both what I care about personally and what the company cares about it, and do that in my job and make sure that I'm thinking about that in the context of what I need to do every day as a senior associate at PwC in the risk assurance practice. That's really hard, but that's what people are looking for. The reason why they're there more so than that PwC is gonna get paid for it. And the last gap that we saw and this brings me back to my days on um, talent acquisition, is that people have not changed the way in which they hire. So again, 79% C-suite say it's very important that we focus on purpose, yet only 29% have changed their hiring process. People want to know about this in the hiring process. They want to know that you're an organization that looks at this. Now, interestingly enough, there's a company that did some research imperative that said, looking at the total population of people who are employable, only about 28% of people are purpose-oriented. So actually are going in looking for that job that connects the dots with this is who I am as an individual and this is what I want to do. You do have companies like LinkedIn and others that have said, you know what? We're only going to go after that 28% then and they've created their selection processes totally focused on just getting that 28. At PwC, we hire too many people, so I can't just go after the 28. We would never meet our number. We can never do that. So we have to figure out how do you talk about it so you get some of those people who are predisposed, but you get others to be able to understand the value of it and how you could work within an organization and actually have that as part of it. Because what we know is if you can bake this into the culture of the organization, and so it's saying, how does this fit into how you recruit people and the types of questions that you ask? How do you embed this into, and I heard the discussion and everyone hates performance appraisals. Oh, they're horrible. But how do you embed it into that process? So you're asking people to comment on not just what they did, the transaction of it and how they did it, but why they did it and why they felt good about it, and why they felt like that was something that the company, it was helping to move the company forward. How do you start to train? One of the things that certainly, because we're in a very technical field, when we wanted to train people, it was like, here are the 10 things that you need to do in order to do this tax process effectively. We can't teach like that anymore. We have to say why this is important. Why is this tax issue important for you to learn and what are the ramifications of that on the organizations and the clients that you're going to work with and then in turn on how they're going to be able to treat their employees and how they're going to be able to service their clients not just here it is and teach it and move on so this is something that throughout everything in human capital you have to change what this looks like and how you address people because what we have found is that people who are more purpose-led by their organizations will stay up to 5.3 times longer. And I don't know about your organizations, but for us, that's huge. Which is one of the reasons that we said this is important for us to not just say it's a tagline and move away from it, but really to be able to embrace it, to say this is who we are and this is a part of the culture. Now, I think there's all these things that can come down on high when you look at human capital and how it always evolves, right? And whether it's corporate responsibility, and whether it's work-life balance, whether it's pay, whether it's flexibility, right? I, you know, all these things come to bear. Purpose is one that I think can get you thinking in a different way about how do you get the human psyche 
connected to the business psyche? And how can you get your people to fundamentally think about their work in a different way? And frankly, allow you to come up with different products and services and uses for what you do with those products and services to be able to elevate society because we know the gap society has that cannot be filled without business trying to put their efforts to that. So I, I do think it's something that we're seeing more and more companies trying to reflect on what is that for us. And this next stage of how do you engage employees is allowing them that freedom to look at how their job is structured and to be able to look at the content of their role and to be able to change that in a very authentic way. The hardest thing is especially as you're talking about individual purpose, you're talking about person by person. The sweeping messages, no matter how small or big your organization are, just don't seem to work, as well as being able to either now have the coach or mentor or some kind of relationship individual, that person has to start to facilitate those messages. The good news is, again, this is one of the things that's cross-generational. We have found more luck with pairing millennials on this with baby boomers to have a purpose discussion because the boomers can have a purpose discussion because they felt like they went so long at work without having a purpose or being able to talk about it. So when you start to put those two generations together to talk about purpose, it seems to really work. But I think it looks differently for each organization and how it fits in authentically and not something that seems staged because we have found out very, um, sometimes very hard, that authenticity and as soon as you don't do something consistent, this generation will sniff that out. And they'll be all over social media saying, hey, everyone said this was important, but look what happened over here. And so I think that consistency is something that really makes a difference. So that's a little bit about our journey and where we've been and where we continue to go. It is something that is a journey. This will take a long time to be able to get to. 50,000 people in the US, 250,000 people globally, trying to make them understand the work that they do. And more importantly, having our leadership reflect on the work that we do. Should we be selling the tax products we, cert we currently have, or should we not? How do we build trust? When you look at the Edelman Trust Index, how do we build trust in society? And are there things that we're doing in our industry that's not helping to build trust? So what do we need to take off the table? And so it really makes you reflect internally on your business process, as well as how you begin to approach your individual employees. Does anyone have any questions around purpose or what that might look like within your organization? The, you brought up a very important point. One of the things that we did in our organization is basically ask every employee, do you know why you're doing, how what you're doing is going to impact the end customer? Within a few months, it led to a lot of innovation. So continuous innovation, and millennials love it. And in fact, everybody else loves it because whatever they come up with is being recognized by their peers. And peer recognition is so important. No, I think that's right. I mean, there's a, a framework that people use out there, the why, what, how, right? And so why is kind of your purpose. Your what is your mission. That's what we're driven to do. For us, we're protecting the capital markets, but that's a what. And then your how are your behaviors and values that underpin what is that going to look like? How are we trying to act in order to live up to that mission and have that mission then live up to its purpose? And it is, and it's a simple equation and the more you talk about it, the easier that it gets for people to be able to really associate with. Yeah. Jesse, you mentioned that you are integrating purpose. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. My name's Lisa Bartha. I'm from Zurich, by the way. Um, you mentioned that you're integrating purpose into your talent acquisition process. Are you doing anything, or, or what are you doing to integrate it into the end-to-end -end employee experience? So it has started with looking at what are the questions that we ask. And so before it was very behavioral, behavioral uh, interviews, competency-based interviews, but now it's trying to get at the why. 
right? So not just what did you do and you know, what was your career path before, but why are the choices that you make important? Why did that help to tell the story about who you are? And so really changing that. We also have looked end to end at what of our uh, learning development. So from onboarding, all the way through the learning and development cycle. So now milestone courses have individual sessions on purpose, both a standalone as well as integrated. So again, we believe we have to teach people differently throughout the entire process. And then we've also found really interesting um, milestone marks. And so your typical millennial now will stay at their job for 18 months. After 18 months, they'll leave the job and they'll go to the next job, which leads to all crazy things. I mean, a combination of not only are they not getting the longevity and, and living at the company, but they're not using their 401ks. Like there's so many different things that are happening because of that. So what we do is once you reach senior associate, which you're there probably around two years for anybody, um, we send you for one week, you go out to California uh, at uh, thousands of people at a time, and it's called the Discover Program. And you get your own personal mentor that you work with, and they help you figure out and start to say, what is my purpose? So you actually are starting to think at that time, because typically at that 18 month mark, millennials will do what we probably all should have done, where they'll look up and go, really? Like, this is it? Like, the, the next 20 years, I'm gonna be sitting in this cube, and I'm gonna be doing this? <laughs> they actually ask that question, and so we want, when they're about to ask it, to take them and say, okay, yes, so let's talk about that. And so I think we've really looked at how do you evolve that and then all the way up and including as we get people to retire and partners who are looking to go out the door. What is now as they look to start their second careers, right? What does that look like and what is their purpose? So really trying to track it all the way through the life cycle. Well, great. I'm up. Thanks, Elliot. <laughs>